I had written an article on the greenhouse effect. It was a year-end article. They wanted me to pick out the most important scientific event of 1988. And I really thought that the most important scientific event of 1988 would only be recognized sometime in the future when you get a little perspective. But I thought that the most interesting scientific event of 1988 was the way everyone started speaking about the greenhouse effect just because there was a hot summer and a drought when I had been talking about the greenhouse effect for 20 years at least. Uh, and there are other people who talked about it before I did. I mean, I didn't invent it. So I explained what was meant by the greenhouse effect. And I also explained that not only were we constantly pumping carbon dioxide into the atmosphere because we're burning fossil fuels, coal and oil and gas, so that the content of the atmosphere, as far as carbon dioxide is concerned, has been going up steadily not very rapidly, but steadily, ever since 1900. And it's continuing to do so. The amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere now is 50% higher than it was in 1900. It's still, it's still only a little over 300, 0.035%, which is not enough to bother us as far as breathing is concerned. But it's enough to trap the infrared waves that Earth reflects into space and to raise the temperature of the Earth slightly. The temperature will keep on going up. And not only are we piling in more and more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, but we are chopping down the forests of the Earth at a great rate. And the forests themselves are the most efficient consumers of carbon dioxide that there are on Earth. Anything that substitutes for the forests, like let us say grain fields or grasslands, are not going to consume carbon dioxide as efficiently. And if we replace them with desert, which is most likely, it won't absorb the carbon dioxide at all. So that in a sense we are contributing to the greenhouse effect in two ways. By, by pushing the output of carbon dioxide and inhibiting the input, so to speak. I said, therefore, when Brazil begins to cut down the rainforests of the Amazon, not only is it destroying a habitat for vast numbers of plant and animal life, which could be of great use to us, there are perhaps pharmacological products we know nothing about that are produced by these forms of life that if we knew about could advance the art of pharmacology and the, and the practice of medicine enormously. And we'll never find out. We're going to drive them to extinction. We're going to destroy the ground because the soil of a rainforest isn't very good. And when you chop it down, it doesn't make for good farming. What it makes is for good deserts. And finally, we're going to cut down on absorbing the carbon dioxide and on producing oxygen so that we are actually tampering with the climate of the Earth and with the very atmosphere that we breathe. So that under those circumstances, it is useless for Brazil to say that she can do what she wants with her own. That the rainforest belongs to her, and if she wants to cut them down, she can. The rainforest doesn't belong to her, it belongs to humanity. She is merely the custodian of the rainforest. I said that in the course of my of my article, and I got a letter in which a young man said, who gave the United States the right to tell Brazil what to do? What if Brazil says to us that we produce far more carbon dioxide than any other nation because we have more automobiles, we have more motors, we have more industry, and we are polluting the atmosphere far more on a per capita basis than anyone else on Earth. And therefore, why shouldn't they have the right to tell us to cut down our, on our industry, to, to clean up our pollution, instead of telling them not to cut down their forests? And I answered and said, you make a very good point. But now, look through my article and see where I said 
It was the United States who was supposed to make these decisions. I didn't say anywhere that it was the American right to police the world or to tell them what to do. And in fact, that gets to the nub of the whole point, that we are facing problems that transcend nations. That when we talk about the greenhouse effect, we're talking about something that affects not just the United States, not just Brazil. That affects the entire Earth for the worse. When we talk about the disappearance of the ozone layer, and everyone says, well, gee, if the ozone layer goes, there'll be more skin cancers, more eye cataracts. That's the least of it. We don't know what will happen when the ozone layer goes. We're going to have a lot more uh, ultraviolet rays hitting the surface of the Earth, perhaps killing the plankton in the oceans, perhaps killing the soil bacteria, upsetting the eco ecological balance very fundamentally, making the Earth a lot less livable. Skin cancer might be the last thing we have to worry about. Or as someone else says, well, it just means you go out with a sunshade, you put on suntan oil, that's for human beings, of course. We go around doing the same to all the little bacteria in the soil and so on. But if that happens, if we do lose the ozone layer, it's for the whole world that is lost. It doesn't matter which nation makes use of chlorofluorocarbons most. We all get it. If the population goes up to the point where we destroy the resources of the Earth, it doesn't matter which nation is most populous, we all get it in the neck. If we have a nuclear war that produces a nuclear winter or a fallout that kills people everywhere, it doesn't matter who started the war, it doesn't matter at whom the nuclear bombs were aimed, we'll all get it. You can go through the entire list of dangers that face humanity. And the very point of the whole thing is that they face humanity and not any one section of it. And therefore, I might say in passing that this should be of peculiar interest to humanists. I have always thought that the reason we're called humanists is that we're involved with human beings as opposed to the supernatural, the existence of which is dubious at best. But if we are going to be interested in and involved with human beings, then I fail to see anything in the name that distinguishes between one set of human beings and another set. We are all human beings. If there's one thing that it is biologically certain, about the human species is that it is a human species, one species. The similarities among us are enormous. The differences are trivial. The differences between the chimpanzee and the human being is less than you might think. It has been calculated that only 1% of the genes in humans and chimpanzees are different. But that 1% makes for two different species, quite different species. And that between varieties of human beings is not only less than 1% difference, but far less than 1% difference. So that it is trivial. And when we think of what human beings have done to each other, on the grounds of such trivial reasons. We have to shudder at history and think that it is criminal for all of Earth now, now, not to be humanists, because now, when all human beings are facing the same problems, and these problems are life and death problems, they go to the root of the viability of the planet itself, and in order to solve these problems, in order to make sure not just that our progeny will be prosperous, that our progeny will be peaceful, 
but that our progeny will live to go to the solution of these problems, we cannot expect that this will be done by individual nations. We do not no, any longer live in the 19th century. In the 19th century, when, when nationalism was in its heyday, it was possible for a single nation to believe it could make itself prosperous without reference to the rest of the world. That if it had a war, and if it was a quick war, it could recompense itself for all damages by, by smiting and, and squeezing the defeated nation. That it could get indemnities, that it could take. This is not possible anymore. It is no longer possible to have a war in which the damage done is not far greater than any nation can afford, in which it is even possible or conceivable that one nation may win if the world as a whole loses. We have become so small. The world has become so fragile. Our weapons have become so powerful that we cannot use those weapons any longer, that we cannot subject the earth to the tortures we can now inflict upon it. The only way we can solve a problem is by a human solution, a totally human solution, an international solution, a cooperative solution. It is important that the world get together and be sufficiently a unit to face the problems which attack us as a unit. The problems with the ocean, with the atmosphere, with the soil, with the population, with pollution, with anything you want to aim. Do not distinguish among us. How then can we distinguish among ourselves? There must be some way of getting together and of deciding not that the United States will tell Brazil what to do, not what Brazil will tell the United States what to do, but what the people of the earth will tell themselves they must do. We have no difficulty applying this principle to the United States itself. We don't say that New York hasn't got the right to tell California what to do, that California hasn't got the right to tell Florida what to do. When it comes to international trade, when it comes to any facet of national life that rises above the parochial needs of cities and states, the federal government tells all the states what to do, and the federal government can do it because it consists of representatives from all the states. Well, what we need is some sort of federal world government, and the only problem is how we manage to do that.